really, really pleased that we could um, lure Alfredo Brillenborg from, from Zurich and other parts of the world to join us today. Um, Alfredo is uh, the founding partner of Urban Think Tank, an interdisciplinary design studio at the intersection of contemporary architecture and urbanism. <clears throat> His focus is on the education of a, and development of a new generation of professionals, from civil engineers to communication specialists who will transform cities in the 21st century. Brillenborg has taught at Columbia University where he co-founded Sustainable Living Urban Model Laboratory, Slum Lab, and currently holds the chair for architecture and urban design at the Swiss Institute of Technology in Zurich. Um, urban Think Tank won the Golden Lion Award last year at the last year's <clears throat> Venice Biennale for their study of the Torre David in Caracas. And uh, <clears throat> they won the Silver Holcim Award for their Gratau project in um, Sao Paulo in a Sao Paulo favela. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alfredo Brillenborg this morning. So yesterday we heard a lot about bicycles and mobility, and we heard about, um, we've heard about apps, and we heard about all kinds of digital technologies that will get us through and create a better um, environment for design, right, and for as a planning tool. But I tell you, there's the majority of the world doesn't have access to any of these things. And um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I am a little bit like uh, St. Christopher, who the story goes, Shimaseni, the late Shimaseni, who was a professor at Harvard of my brothers, um, used to tell a story at St. Christopher. He said that St. Christopher was in a small monk's cell and he was praying to God and he put his hand out to God and then a bird came and deposited a nest on the hand. And he decided that he would not move his arm till the uh, birds had been hatched. So in a way, Hubert and I held out our arm to figure out how we could create a kind of toolbox to change the realities of the majority of the world, which is this southern globe uh, from South America to Africa to India and Asia, which is, doesn't have the means and resources. So maybe I say to all of you as students or architects, um, find your own comfort level. I was very uncomfortable with the way I saw the world. But I'm also very emotional because Yosemite is where my brother died. So I'm back after 22 years uh, here in San Francisco. That was him, and he was a hippie, he was a poet, and Seamus Haney was his advisor, Gustavo Brillenborg. And, um, and so I kind of dedicate this to him, to freedom, to free towns, and somehow um, it's uh, kind of important to be here. And so I will read you what characterized Gustavo in my upbringing. Caracas, you wander back and forth like the hurt pilgrim that you are, seeking the Mecca that floats, always possessed that demon self that gives no chance to the rational. Your mad, grossly vivid pace that frees you to wander and condemns you to search. What is there, my friend? I know you, my reflection, you stare with me, birth, death, desire, language, thighs, parents, insecurity, past mention. You sail with me north to the country of promises. You sailed with me, and yet you never left the beaches of your pulse. So in a way, I was educated between the North and the South. I grew up between New York and Caracas. And ever since um, reflecting on always going up to the North for school and back to home to my house, um, it, made a, it made a kind of that contrast, gave me, the, gave me the measure to be able to figure out that I wanted to dedicate myself to somehow um, bridging that gap between these worlds. And what you see here is just um, a few scenes from a movie that we're working on, which is called Gran Horizonte, which is a walk in the urban planet. Or if you want, 80 worlds in one day. It'll be released probably next year. A little documentary on the way the world is urbanizing. But if I reflect on, on America versus South America, I have to say that We've been watching protests against, oppress, against oppressive regimes that concentrate massive wealth in the hands of an elite few. Yet in our own democracy, 1% of the people take in nearly a quarter of the nation's income, an inequality that even the wealthy will come to the regret. All growth in recent decades has gone more to the top 
than to the bottom. In terms of in income equality, America lags behind any country in Europe. While many of the old centers in Latin America, such as Brazil, have been striving in recent years rather successfully to improve the plight of the poor and reduce the gaps in income. America, North America, has allowed inequality to grow. So that was by Joseph Stieglitz, Nobel Prize winner. So I think it's very important that Berkeley, and I feel it seriously this way, and this conference proves it to me, and that's why I came so long from, from Switzerland, was because I do believe that somehow here in the People's Park, in the Freedom Circle, and somehow Berkeley holds the reins to alternative urbanism. If, if, and Margaret Crawford's book, I recommend to all of you, of course, Everyday Urbanism, is maybe the, one of the first moments that it started to become a theory in and of itself, which I think uh, Rebars has actually um, done a great job in forwarding that. Curiously, I was in Oslo a few weeks ago, and there I was making a judge on a competition for parking day. So it came all the way here, and now it's being applied all over the world. So forget about utopia. This is a dispatch from the front lines of our urban planet. This is a logbook entry from the Petri dish of social transformation throughout the Americas. It's a speculation on the future of the city, a vast modernizing landscape from North America's sprawl city to the dense megacities of South America. Designers' architects are forced to work like dogs, digging in the ditch in order to create a coherent and sustainable urban model. And this brings me to kind of the image of Howard Rourke and on the right from Peru, um, uh, contrasting is this loss of legitimacy of the architect. We become kind of decorators. In the 19, in the 60s and 70s, Christopher Alexander being one of the principal ones uh, with Chermatov writing in community uh, design uh, uh, articles, somehow we lost it. Why? Because in the 70s, the oil crisis came and we really, we, uh, architects were forced to really go into whatever other profession just to survive. But, and then the 80s came along, it was the boom, economic boom, and then the 90s continued, and architects lost their legitimacy in the public uh, realm. Um, we went to being a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, form makers, only interested in the shape of buildings, in the way things looked but never getting at the heart again, like in the 60s, uh, to content. So this is a still from a movie called Memorias del Subdesarrollo, Memories of Underdevelopment, an incredible film uh, done in Cuba just after the revolution, which portrays Sergio, this man looking through a telescope who's a good bourgeois. I identify myself with him in his own country, and he stays to see what the revolution would bring and his encounter with this revolution. And he starts to look at the city, and he says, here, everything is the same. All of a sudden, the city becomes to look like a set of cardboard because everything was equalized in the Cuban revolution. And, and I say, also, architecture has become to look like cardboard. Whether it's San Francisco, San Francisco's looking like Los Angeles now. I mean, it's unbelievable. So what happened to that intrinsic nature of building the space by the people, with the people, building your social space out? And this is the essence of our learning from Latin America and informality. Manfredo Taufuri in 76, also in the 1980s, has a problem with Aldo Rossi's Biennale entry. And he says, well, it will be insignificant be, uh, because, and he goes, the experimental quarters or settlements, actual built utopias at the edge of the urban reality, are very little conditioned by the historic centers, and the productive areas of the city continue to accumulate and multiply their contradictions. So as the formal part of the city multiplies their contradictions, the informal city actually really deeply represents a kind of utopia. So here what you see is up on our metro cable hill where we did the cable hill, you'll learn about later, looking out from the slums to the city, a, a view seldom seen. And, and as this uh, young man said, what you call a slum, I call my home. So we began early on, Hubert and I, do, as an NGO called Caracas Think Tank, while we had a day job, usual doing architectural practice. We began to give out these prizes, basketball tournaments, etc. 
And then we would go back every year to do the tournament. And every year, one of these kids was no longer alive. So we said, we really have to change. So we began, we started a little t-shirt uh, uh, financing. We began conferences. We brought, brought down a lot of people to my basement in Caracas. This is a little exhibition. And we made a movie called Caracas, the Informal City to kind of get out what we felt uncomfortable with. And it says, it's called the Manifesto No. Probably today I would do the Manifesto C. We didn't come here to acquire courses of diplomacy. We didn't come here to acquire a culture with comfortable uh, 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 um, purpose. We came here to confront ourselves with the urban problems, to call things by their name. And I won't go on. Just to tell you that I began studying film with Milos Forman at Columbia University. Then I went on to, with Saul Yurkovic to study Latin American literature. And I was trying to avoid to come to architecture. But suddenly I couldn't avoid it and it became easy and I ended up becoming an architect. But I think to change the core of architecture and urban design, you have to go to the periphery, to the edges where architecture blurs into other disciplines. Um, and so here Taufuri goes on to say that Aldo Rossi's Biennale entry was harmless enough. It was the postmodern era because the discipline had lost its legitimacy. But we wrote in our book, Informal City, not knowing that quote by Taufuri, later I found it, uh, we wrote in our Informal City book of 2005, therein lies the historic era of urban planners and designers and of architects. They failed to see, let alone analyze or capitalize upon the informal aspects of urban life because they lack professional vocabulary for describing them. Their vision is shaped and therefore also limited by their theories which, as in the 2004 Biennale Metamorph design presentation of the Arctic Biennale, so dramatically demonstrated. So there again, and what an irony, we end up doing the craziest Biennale entry last year. We, didn't, we had no intention of any, uh, uh, of any uh, idea. We went, over, we went over runs and we did this kind of restaurant, which is actually on the 34th floor of the Torre David skyscraper, squatted skyscraper in Caracas, and it's called Gran Horizonte, is the real restaurant. And we kind of recreated this restaurant with a cafe, and we serve Venezuelan food, and we had films and monitors all around, and the photographs in the space were representing our travels, our vision of the horizon of urban design. What happened was everyone gathered, ate there, and the food became the common ground. So cooking the city, the whole thing, and yesterday we heard it, it's really about what bonds people together, what's the glue. So for us, the glue was maybe the urban fabric, of course, we were showing, but also it was the fact that we should eat together. So we began at ETH after Columbia University. We got called to Zurich, and, and we accepted the challenge to start that school up and change it around. We began a, um, something called Urban Stories, producing knowledge for the city. Which urban plans, which instruments, which visions, which political decisions, economic reasonings, cultural inputs, and social organization have been used to operate in urban settlements? If you look at this map done at Harvard with Christian Vertman, the pixelation is the growth of the population from now to 2050. You heard a lot about that yesterday. Um, but most of that growth, and that's what uh, Jill did not say, most of that growth will be in the south, and it will be in slums. That's an important thing. So when I was born, we all saw the Earth from the moon like that, beautiful blue uh, uh, planet. Now it's an interconnected, urbanized planet. If you're not thinking about the globe, you're not really thinking at all. So in that sense, we started a magazine called the Slum Lab, which was mentioned at the beginning. This is Last Round Ecology. We have a few copies here at the front. Um, we'll certainly leave some donated to the university now. But the idea is, what do we do to build a more equitable city on this urban planet? So we began with all kinds of courses, action on the real city, mapping the real city, or plug into the city. Um, and this is kind of my team going all around the world looking at favelas, but we want to understand why we should act as architects, what we should interpret, where to act, and who to identify as the leaders 
on which to move forward project. So we started to look at these modern utopias, these micro-planning, urbanism, and create a kind of toolbox for the city. We map them out, and we try and sh uh, do comparisons. So here you've got the 19th century city, right? The industrial city, the, and then here you've got modern urbanism, 20th century urbanism, the sprawl, the, you know, the tabula rasa, modernism. But we are situated now in 21st uh, uh, urbanism. So what would those be? Micro spaces, temporary programming, reprogramming the existing, and informality. So we need a new lexicon. We need a new vocabulary to be able to deal with that. And it's curious, but I flew over the, the prairies, of course, yesterday as I was coming here, and actually saw Frank Lloyd Wright's vision, these kind of one-acre lots. I do believe, of course, that was a, a, a maybe a flawed vision because it was a little bit too agrarian, but I do believe that we can come up with some kind of, um, kind of urban agrarian lifestyle. And that you can see already happening in the sprawl in Latin America or in India or in China. The, the sprawl of this urbanization into agricultural fields is producing a kind of agro-urban um, experiment. Of course, very unsuccessful in China, but I think that it could be rethought. So we've got the individual world, we've got the public world, and we've got the scientific world. I'm coming from a science university, and what happened was architecture was divided in the 20th century between science and art. There are art schools who teach architecture, and there are science schools that teach architecture, engineering, etc. And I think this division was terrible. The division between the different disciplines around architecture, from landscape, from, uh, from urbanism, from planning, to architecture and urban design, is a mistake. Uh, uh, someone should graduate, and I understand that you guys here in this environmental design school are integrated somehow better than most other schools. But I do believe a student should graduate with a holistic understanding and with credits in all of these um, disciplines, not, not, not only in one, and you graduate as an architect in the same way Brunelleschi or anyone from the Renaissance would have graduated, right? So ETH has this model, transdisciplinary model that we're trying to work on, which is environmental science, architecture, and, um, and engineering. But we're trying to integrate all the rest, the earth scientists, the humanities, the management, the mechanical, the mathematics, the physics. We're trying to integrate them into a new experiment. Why? Because if we don't get into policy issues, this is going to continue to happen. This is the map of the IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, of all the interventions that they're financing of infrastructure in Latin America. Connecting bridges, dams through the Amazon, et cetera, highways cutting through it. So it's quite scary what's going to happen. So we went to that organization and we said, let's, let's join forces. ETH can help you to become your partners when you go and do investments. So we have now the first IDB, ETH, and SECO, which is the Swiss um, finance organization, ministry. And we are, have now the first model, and we're now in stage one of how that model will work with the IDB to go hand in hand, create a toolbox for secondary sustainable cities. We're looking at 20 cities. So the idea now is to unite everyone together. And the university is the perfect platform for this to happen on. It's the neutral territory in which we can all work together without competition, I would say. And what do we have to do? We have to tackle this. This is just the outskirts around the hills of Caracas. If you do not fly in, an air, in a little airplane around or a helicopter, you'll never see it. Half of my friends have never seen it. And, but that is the reality why we have these redeemers, these South American leaders that have been so dangerous for Latin America with their ideologies. And what it does is increase the, increase the poverty, fleeing from nature. What you see here is every day in Sao Paulo, every year, sorry, the uh, favelas flood. In Caracas, here you have see the mudslide that came down and displaced 150,000 people. Here in Recife, in Jordan, where there's only 60 liters of water per person, where the United States has 500 liters of water per person spent per day. In Recife, this was an old uh, mine 
the English were going for, for, um, for phosphate, mining for phosphate in the Zarka River Valley. Well, when they, the mine was up and they had exploited everything they could, they let the Palestinian camps come in to this area. So the Palestinians are sitting on top of radon mines, which is when it rains. Thank God it doesn't rain often. But when water touches the, the mines, it produces radon gas, which goes through the houses. But no one cares because if it's well ventilated, nothing happens. But if a little kid is in a room with no windows and that gas is caught inside, it can be super toxic. But what can be done? You know the situation of Jordan today, right? Or when I showed you that picture of the kids with the basketball tournament prizes, this is the field where they played on. During the day, it was a basketball field, but at night, it was a shooting gallery. There you see the holes painted on the walls. Or here, in, in, again in Sao Paulo, a developer tried to get rid of the squatters on their land. Remember yesterday you heard Gil show a picture of a fantastic slum eradication? Maybe, maybe you remember. He said, here there was a slum, and now we've turned it into a fantastic park. I don't doubt that that park is great, but I want to know where the dwellers went. So here, the developer started a uh, fire on purpose to get them out. So what you see here, this is what I'm talking about. This is Argentina, on the periphery of Argentina. Can we come up with a model that, that is kind of, that, that is agricultural, but actually urban at the same time? Well, we have to try. This is a long way in, and maybe I don't get to my work, and maybe it's just going to be one little movie at the end if I don't make it. But I want to tell you what's going on in the world, right? How do you see it? This is the London Olympics. Everyone heard so much about it, right? Well, I tell you, it's being built right back there. They spent about 13 billion pounds. And what did they get? This little area right here and a couple of stadiums and a couple of buildings. This is taken from the airplane. Was that worth, and they got a train station. Yes, okay, now there's a good connectivity. There's a couple of things that happened that were good. But 13 billion pounds, and the neighborhoods standing right next to the periphery, but it was not part of the Olympic, not inside the Olympic grounds, right? Hackney Wick got nothing. Well, Hackney Wick is actually where Hackney Wick is actually where Tracy Emin and a lot of uh, British artists are living. And um, now, however, they're coming to redevelop Hackney Wick based on this park, and they're pushing everyone out. So I tell you, urban development is it can be can be really unjust. But we're looking at these case study examples, and I'll show you another one around Bangalore. So Bangalore could grow up to, up to 10 million people by 2015, but will authorities achieve a fair distribution of resources? The West always lectures uh, the South, right, on doing better architecture and sustainable urbanism, right? But 20% of the world's population, which is the North uh, part of the globe, is using 80% of its resources, right? So here you see the towns between Delhi and Mumbai. These are concentrated quite good agricultural villages. What's happening? Those villages are expanding like a rhizome, right? As you know, there will be 300 million people that will come into India in the next 20 years, right? And now you see here, you cannot see it maybe, but you can see now the parcels laid out for city expansion, what was once agricultural land. And this is a very... Uh, uh, photo, bad photo, but you see here all the different typologies of an uh, unassembled urbanism and because of the growth. When you, when you come into Bangalore's airport and you drive to the center of the city, what you see all along the murals are these developer housing. Water's Edge, you know, green, Greenage, Luxuria, a life full of privilege awaits you. This is for who? Who is it attending? Who is manipulating this? Who's financing this? Well, you know what? There's about 20 companies in the world that are doing the same thing, same speculation everywhere. And this, and this little village here, behind that side, book a village in peace and serenity. This village is, is going to be completely wiped out. So Mexico City, we heard it from Gil yesterday. They're finding the cheapest available land expanding. It's one company called Hale. 
very close to Vicente Fox, the president, right? And there you see the expansion, and they buy the cheapest available land. They build these track houses, and it becomes a ghetto. There's no schools, no parks, nothing, and it's a real ghetto for the poor. They're ghettoizing again. We didn't, and about 10 people living in these small apartments. Well, thank God people are resilient and they start to transform their building. They start to open up shops inside. And here I moved to Detroit, which I think is an incredible example. And of course, I will get now to some uplifting examples. Detroit was, was, this is actually a plan we did in 1998. We drew it for Richard Plunz, one of the first drawings in ink which shows the, the, the shrinking city of Detroit for an exhibition we did. So there's 167,000 demolition permits. And what people are doing, they're turning it into this incredible agricultural uh, experiment, right? Obviously imperfect. And this is the Han Hans Farm uh, experiment. Very interesting how you can take part, uh, blocks and turn it into a kind of um, cooperative farm. But Incredible ideas and strategies. I won't go into them. Um, vacant housing, vacant land, community-based schools. I think we can learn an incredible lesson of this blue and green infrastructure line, of water and, and green infrastructure. So you see carbon forest, industrial buffer, blue corridor, surface lake. They're starting to have a lexicon and a toolbox in order to implement some incredible things. Sao Paulo to give you another example. So we went Detroit from one of the worst situations to an incredibly progressive situation that we can learn from. In Sao Paulo, a mass of 19 million people in greater Sao Paulo, 19 million, right? And what are they doing or what did they do in the last years? They created these acupuncture uh, ideas of schools that could be recombined. Architecture is almost much too important to be left to architects. So we really need politicians, we need leaders, we need visionary people. And what they said, let's make these typology of buildings that are, can open source them, reuse them, and recombine them to put them. Or you know, here you see pools, for instance. And there's Sao Paulo's uh, periphery, right? All the red, and you see the dots. And the blue dots are all the new acupunctures that have been placed in of these schools called the CEOs, uh, Centros Educativos Unitarios. So we learned from that, from these acupuncture projects, and we said, we can no longer design. The world is too big. The urbanization has gone way out of our hands. What we can do is do acupuncture. So in that cultural crisis, we started to look at Caracas, of course. And the, oh, we have no sound here. Mm-hmm, no sound. Oh, wait. And this is what I came back to. I graduate from Columbia University with a degree on doing parametric design, and what will that do in a context like this? So you really, ha we had to take to the streets, we had to create an organization which now evolved into the urban think tank today. To look at the city in all of its dimensions. Of course, people thought we were crazy. My, my friends and professors at Columbia said, what, going to South America? What for, going to Caracas? You're crazy, that's in a revolution. Then going to slums? You can't make architecture in slums, but it's the people. The point is we forgot the subject of architecture is people. So we began to create these images of the city voided out and the architecture voided out and just bringing out the people. And how did we get into slums? Very simple. We went with my nanny, her son. We went into the hills with their friends, their cousins, their daughters, their children. And we went into these areas to figure out how we would do social design. And we wanted to debunk some of the myths. So informal settlements are not the problem, but the solution. They're de facto here. They've been here for 50 years. Government can't produce enough housing fast enough to catch up with the pace. 
right? They're not defined by illegality anymore because they're de facto legal. They're not defined by lack of urban services because they've retrofit their houses with urban services. Very inadequate, but they've done it, right? Not even precarious materials anymore. They've built houses that are strong and block and, and can resist time. So at Columbia, they taught me how to do this. They taught me how to cut a hill, do a nice landscape for urbanism, and then hire some good architects and work with a couple of friends to do some nice buildings all together, right? This is completely unsustainable. Why the embodied energy of just cutting that hill will never be recuperated. Instead here, the houses don't cut the hill, they poise themselves very lightly, they're basically a pedestrian urbanism, and they are actually, they build out their city with their neighbors in conjunction and form the social spaces together that they might need. And it's inadequate, but what they have done is invented this model we call the growing house. So this is, this is five years earlier, five years later, and you see that as people acquire a little bit of economy, they can extend their house upwards, they can finish it, and it's quite a nice balcony there at the top. So we need a change of legislation that will permit us to have half a house a quarter of a house. Uh, we can get permission to make a room and then add the bathroom to it, etc. So we can grow over time with micro incremental ways. This is the way that we can attach, um, we can really fix the homeless problem. This is the first mapping ever of Caracas informal settlements that we did and we showed to the public in Caracas, to the mayors, and this is how the informal city has grown over time, 2005. We should update that. So we don't draw just maps, uh, but we actually use them as political tools, critical maps, actually to get, make a point. So when I talked about this growing house, curiously, it is, this, it is uh, the domino house of Le Corbusier, which is the element. It's the most modern thing you can imagine, right? It's just the frame, cantilevered, a stair. And people come in and they retrofit it with the cheapest available material. So how can we as architects forget our ego and start to create projects that are strategic? We don't care what they look like, what materials they're finished with. They should be finished with the materials that are readily available or within the budgets and means of the individual. And people know how to build. This is Horacio Gonzalez, Genaro Gonzalez. He's the first dweller of that area that I showed you of La Vega. He had historic photographs of how he did it. Here with a friend cutting, a little bit banking it, creating parcels for his family and friends, banking it, putting a little uh, shack on it at first. This is the hill. And over time, that hill over 25 years got upgraded. So again, it's about working together. Here's a little film. The sound's not important. For me to talk to you a little bit about urbanization. Urban, the process of urbanization can only be seen in two ways. On the one hand, the model of the global city of metropolises like London, New York, Tokyo, and on the other, the global slum cities of Caracas, Sao Paulo, Lagos. Today we know that these two are intimately linked, two sides of the same coin. The global metropolises are in the process of linking up as hotspots not just physically, but with buildings, transport links, power lines, but virtually too by means of radio, mobile phones, social, economic, and cultural networks. For the first time in history, you don't need to live in a city to have an urban lifestyle. Indeed, one can no longer f uh, flee the urban environment. We are completely urbanized, even in the agricultural lands. And it has been transplanted into pockets of suburbia, exurbia, and even rural lifestyles. This is why we within our Caracas project proclaim the Sur Global is everywhere. We no longer live in a planet full of houses, but in a house the size of a planet. Three megatrends, urbanization, globalization, informalization, have helped to spread gated communities, which are often referred to as islands or ghettos. They are the dominant expression of urbanization today. In most cases, they come about without the participation of architects. These two urban species have become focused on our research. The resilience and potential of informality has made them even more interesting 
as a motor of urban production and change. Informal practices are economically so successful that they have aroused the interest of leading groups in the field of urban planning and economic science like today. The Dharavi slum in Mumbai, for example, shows such areas are often considered the sole remaining large-scale reserve lands in cities, producing $10 million a year in revenues. Ten, yes. What is lacking in our opinion is a joint effort to link top-down and bottom-up initiatives. In other words, municipal administration and in general public must sit down together and draw up an agenda for planning this environment. Only then can we meet the basic needs of the population, energy, and transport. So I tell you, yes, bicycles are key, and, and I live in Zurich. It's the greatest town in the world for bicycling and, and, and trams and train networks. But I tell you, it's not going to solve areas of the mega uh, the mega uh, uh, cities of the world. What we need, for instance, is a dry toilet. I'll show you from the smallest projects to a little bit bigger project. The dry toilet is a composting toilet. We got it passed through the Ministry of the Environment. It comes from rural background. It's the first time it's been used in the city. We did it along with Marietika Potrick and Liat Esakov, who we invited down to Caracas. Here you see it when it was under construction. And then we began to do bridges, stairs, small things that could be prefabricated by the dwelling, the residents themselves, connecting their houses, their schools together on the hills. And then pedestrian bridges over highways that would allow people to, to move back and forth from one hill to the next. It was about connectivity, but then we realized we had to go vertical. So we began to think about how we could make a housing prototype that would bring the street up into the air, and it would organize housing units as clusters. Here you see several versions, and you could connect those housing blocks to hills and enter them at any given point. They would have uh, social spaces all distributed through the building. It's about connecting, ramping. It's about this idea of bridging, making an urbanism that's more hybrid, maybe less, less it's formal, yes. We're formalizing the informal because they need some formalization, but we want to informalize the formal city. So this is maybe an interesting example in the formal city. It's the first autistic children's school. We went to Randolph, uh, Randolph uh, uh, Massachusetts to look at the Higashi School for Autistic Children, and, we, and they told us, well, you can't build a school for autistic children on the vertical. We said, oh my God, why not? They said, because the kids, they need to, to, they cannot go upstairs, they can't go up elevators, and that was a problem. We didn't have a piece of land big enough. This is a municipal land here. We do only public buildings now. And so we came up with this idea of a ramp. So the kids would now go up a ramp, they could circulate all around their classrooms, they could look in, everyone would see them, they would have an awareness, they would know where they were going because they can look in through the windows, and they get a little bit of exercise. And that calms them down before they enter the classroom. So here they are as they go up, and they're looking into the music room, and then they arrive at the top at their special gymnasium. So it is absolutely a unique solution for for uh, autistic children, and it's working incredibly well. So here you see some of the other projects. We were the principal architects working on the metro cable of Caracas, 2.4 kilometers of cable car uniting the metro system of Caracas, and you fly up into the hills to three stations. And what took people two hours to walk up hills they could walk, they could walk down and up in 10 minutes now with the cable car. And this was the Chavez government principal project that was developed by us with Doppelmayr and presented to them, and finally in Vienna, he's, through our, the Austrian ambassador, he signed it and executed it. But we were also the architects working with the opposition mayors. These are our gyms for two opposition mayors, and this gym in particular was just inaugurated last week or last month for the candidate who fought terribly against Chavez in two elections and lost. So we believe the city is for all. And we've been caught in the middle. We've been caught in the crossfire at different moments. Of the, but we believe we're not going to align ourselves with ideology. We're going to align ourselves with the city and for the city. This is the vertical gym. So what was 
the first playing field where I used to play soccer and Hubert and I um, would come around this, this place, we thought they wanted a roof. So we said, let's not just do a roof. Let's do four floors of gymnasium. The mayor said, you're crazy. We don't need four floors. We, and, and we said, yes, because in the rainy season, this uh, football pitch, it, it floods. So no one can play. And so the roof was a good idea. And he said, but how do you know that there will be enough um, use of this uh, building if we do four floors? We said, just do it, experiment. So it's almost like, I think mayors, have to go out and declare parts of the city experimental zones. Architects need places to experiment. We need concrete experiments physically done. And that's why the design build studios are so interesting. Now, I can say today, this gym, where only six on six played in mini basketball or foot, now has 15,000 users per month in a 24-7, programmed environment from weddings to chess tournaments to, to uh, bailoterapia, dancing studios, etc. And it has soccer and two multiple courts, one on the top, one below. And our goal, and I was last week talking at the Clinton Global Initiative, our goal is to build 100 of these gyms. We've got five now. Here you see the latest one, which now has an informal vendors market below. And we actually open source these plans to any mayor who wants them. They're for free. Here you see it under construction. They can be placed like a toolbox. They can re be recombined. Here you see it more finished or as it's finishing. And now, maybe to leave you with the last idea about the cable car. The government wanted to open roads, traditional road urbanism. And what we did, we did a mapping of all the houses that had upgraded one floor on top of their villas. And we said to the government, if you tear down, uh, if you build this road, you'll tear down 30% of the fabric. And all of that investment would be lost. So we started to create this idea, a bit crazy. We thought we could do it with funiculars at first, but then Doppelmayr said, no way, you've got to use cable cars for that hill. So we began to do stations, prototypical stations, very simple, um, that could have social spaces underneath. And here you see the cable car functioning today on that hill. The city and now is fantastic. It's the most interesting thing to fly over the city of Caracas and maybe one of the most exciting architectural events in the city. The worst turned into maybe the best or the most interesting. And these hub stations above are now like squares where people can commute and, um, and be together. Do we have time for one more? Yes. Okay. So this is the wholesome prize winning project. Venezuela is known for the genius of the slum, which is Gustavo Dudamel here, right here in the front. Gustavo uh, is actually the director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Whoever can go down to see him play, it's worthwhile seeing him play. So together with him, we, we were able to put on a music fest. For it actually, they were filming a movie, so it was a perfect scene. And in La Vega, we did this um, event. And we realized that people loved it. They were absolutely enamored by it. So we tried together with him to come up with the idea of creating music schools to popularize music, to bring music to the masses, basically. And the idea is these small music schools that could be placed maybe in the worst areas where no infrastructure is, is and create education, sports underneath the music schools. And and have them be like community centers. Where did we get that idea? From looking at the city, seeing it already happening. And when this photo was incredibly revealing, this was little acupuncture projects that could become like lighthouses, that could reveal rhizomatic lighthouses that interconnected, could take these worst areas. This is very bad land, alluvion. Um, it has three springs popping out, so it was, it was constantly flooded, it was, and, and oh, constantly in a landslide. So the idea here is to bank the site, 
create a building in a music school that has a terrace, and a, uh, uh, sorry, a plaza underneath where they can play soccer and perform theaters. The whole site becomes an amphitheater. You have replacement housing on the top, but the whole site works together with the building. We collect all the rainwater, it gets reused, um, cleaned and used in the toilets of the building and the whole top of the, the building is solar energy. So we believe in going completely off the grid as possible. Of course, it'll be plugged into the grid. Here you see the cheapest available building materials, just, you know, block. But the most interesting might be is to say that the building cannot work without its landscape. So it's like the building and the landscape folded up is one with bridges and connections. Aha, the finally, the Torre David, the award-winning project, for whatever good that is, because it's really a problem. It's an incredible story. 17 years ago, a developer built a building in Caracas, um, and it actually related uh, to me. He took a huge financial risk to say, we need a symbol for the modern Caracas. It was the oil economy, and uh, he probably did it with good intention but the banks all crashed. That's what gave on, led on to the revolution, Chavez revolution. Banks crashed, uh, savings were lost, and the building was stopped halfway through. It fell into government hands because government seized all the assets of the bank, and the government left it 17 years standing. But when the mudslides came in the rainy season, which come every year, a group of individuals using mobile phone technology organize themselves to squat the building. What is so interesting from our point of view is the idea that you could create a frame, a vertical frame with water, electricity, uh, inside infrastructures, and let people build out their spaces. So the Gran Horizonte also began with a t-shirt. Then we, we spent one year inside the tower researching. This is the new book just out by Lars Muller in form of vertical communities. And we went to speak to Yona Friedman because we like to tie into the great, the great thinkers of utopia, right? Um, but this is a realizable utopia, which is what Yona talks about now today. It's not a utopia of outer space. No, it's get on the ground like Slavo Sizek says, create your utopia, but do it as an action on the city. So we started to think about this and, and think about the idea of that this building was an ever-changing interaction between subject people and object architecture. Is Torre David a slum at all? What do you guys think? So how does it compare to historical precedents, those in Europe of the 70s or 80s? Can Torre David's reappropriation process become a model for other cities' contact? How far should architects go outside their field up to pointing of becoming sociologists? anthropologists in order to sharpen their own design tools and be more effective in complexity and ever-changing urban environments? What is the balance between informality and structure when you see it as we saw it documented in our work? What are the limits of architecture vis-a-vis -vis increasingly fluid and complex social cultural settings? There are also some very important questions that are raised by our work and we still don't have the answers but the questions are good enough for us. One of these provocations, for example, revolves around the question of what kind of architect is required to guide an intervention like Torre David. Well, the architects in, in my school, uh, my AIA, if you want, Architects Association in Venezuela, say that it's a vertical slum. I tell you it's not. It's a luxurious building with incredible concrete frame, rise 45 floors, smack in the center of the city, Right? That's not a slum. That's incredibly privileged. So, and what's happening inside is also incredibly interesting. So these are all the areas and buildings around the central red mass, which is Torre David, that have workforces who are living in the tower and working in one, ra one mile radius around the tower. So they're working next to their home. That's incredible, luxurious. And what they said to us was, do you prefer that we go squat the hills on the periphery, turn a park into slum, or reuse existing infrastructures that the government has abandoned? So they begin building out their walls. 
They also have aspirations to a normal uh, apartment life, right? And this is what they've achieved. It's quite extraordinary. It's with their own income. So what is this saying? What, what Milton Friedman curiously says, can we reconcile Marx and Friedman, right? I'm not so sure, but, but this, tower might, <laughs> this, this tower might do it, maybe. Because Friedman does believe in the power of the individual. But, but actually, the individual must be tied together collectively, right? And what ties all these people in this tower together is the infrastructure. They all have a responsibility for pumping the water up. They all have a responsibility with microelectrical systems of each one taking turns of how, mu how much electricity they use. They share kitchens. They work in communal. They distribute food. Inside, you have, um, you have a whole system for distribution up the parking garage. One dollar takes you up. They have hairdressing salons inside. Workforces, blue jeans being made. And the tower is only occupied here in this middle section, 25 floors, because the top is too thin to occupy. But I'm sure they'll get up to the top. We made all kinds of studies on the solar exposure. We talked with them, and we actually are now in discussion with Schindler Elevators to put an elevator on the outside of the building, on top of the parking garage, to go up the existing, to do the rest of the floors, the 10 floors, right? And plug into all the microsystems and enhance all the microsystems. And we use the top of the building, because Caracas has a great east-west wind for all these aeolic um, uh, uh, energy uh, windmills. And the elevator would be connected to the street. And what's this vision? This vision is an experiment, of course. We didn't create it. We found it. So the idea is, can we have these centralized hubs in cities that distribute, that work collectively, that are kind of, let's say, like a Cedric uh, Pr Price's fun palace, right? Where we could have elevators that work as public goods, just like you see now. You, you might not know this, but in Medellin, they put escalators, electric escalators in the slums. So can we have elevator and escalator companies thinking of their elevator towers as buildings that would connect, not a, an elevator in every building, but a public elevator that leads you to sky lobbies, what we call this kind of parangole. But what is this invention? And I leave you with this kind of landscape, new landscape idea for the conference. We looked at London, and we see that London with these red spots the intensity of interaction of London happens when the streets are more interconnected. Here you see actually the patterns. The spatial lab uh, created these, these drawings and this, these algorithms that, that show you that there's more human interaction where there's more connection. So we say, let's take centers of cities like Sao Paulo or wherever you want, where there's a train, there's a tram and a bus connection. Let's, let's, the last mile, which Jill was talking about, right? He showed a lot of bicycles, right? A lot of people moving bicycles in the last mile. But can an old lady really use a bicycle? Can, how do you get your groceries with two bags that last mile on the bike? Well, yes, you can balance it, right? But there's all kinds of issues. So we need more than bicycles. We need whole electric mobility. We need tuk-tuks. We need all kinds of a family of integrated mobility for this last mile. But let's look at that idea of the 3D city. So we cut the city into layers. And we say, why can't we create zoning patterns that, that will give you extended uh, height or densities if you connect with your neighbors? Just like the favelas, who are connecting with little stair systems between and around. Can we imagine a city that somehow is all interconnected, the street up in the air, where you would have elevator banks that would connect you to different buildings, through buildings, underneath buildings, right? A little bit like Mumbai. This is Bandra where you're moving and connecting at different levels with their skywalk, right? Of course, you would have app technologies that would show you how to meet a friend on a roof terrace, where a cinema would be playing, right? And you would have this whole family mobility catalog of different things that would get you through escalators, and you could time it, and your cell phone would tell you how to move through this complex and dense urbanism. Of course, this is a little bit of a fantasy, right? But maybe not, because it's already happening in Mumbai. It's already happening in Sao Paulo. There are pieces of this idea that we just look, find, and 
and take. And at nighttime, you could read the buildings, what's public and what's private from the outside with the light. So you would know, and this is maybe a little archigram interpretation of these ideas, right? But just to conclude now, so given this dilemma, we decided as a design firm to implement realizable micro projects rather than proposing, you know, these, these uh, maybe bigger plans. But now we're moving maybe into the, to another scale, which is the last mile scale. In dis, in we decided to, to uh, change the idea of market, market interests, institutional priorities within cities and slums. We want to change policy. And that the, if the policy can change the morphology of the city, maybe you remember Hugh Ferris with the setbacks and how that changes the morphology of cities. Our project is not a philanthrop philanthropy. It's to redefine design in our socioeconomic system in a more integrated way. Socially responsible urban planning that begins with an exchange between local conditions and populations and multidisciplinary experts for the ever-growing city. Thank you.